Hello everybody, uh, today we're going to be giving you an introduction to moral theory. So we've talked about a lot of different moral principles and characteristics of moral reasoning, uh, but these moral principles that we've talked about of autonomy, utility, uh, justice, beneficence, and non-maleficence, they come from, they're grounded in uh, more fundamental moral theories. So today we're going to look at those underlying moral theories, see what different theories of objective moral law exist. And so there is a lot of controversy over which of these theories is the correct one. We're not going to be answering that question. Uh, that's an ethical theory class question. Instead, we're just going to be giving you an introduction to all these theories so that you're familiar with the types of reasoning that each theorist applies to bioethical dilemmas. Okay, so let's look at uh, some of these moral theories. So the book does a fantastic job of outlining each of these different moral theories. So I'm not going to spend as much time in detail as the book did. We're just going to give you sort of the spark notes so you're familiar with the really important bits of each theory. So first we're going to look at utilitarianism. And the general principle of utilitarianism is that we should always act so as to maximize utility. So it's a theory about when our actions are right or wrong. So uh, our action is uh, morally permissible, in fact morally obligatory, if it maximizes utility, and our action is morally wrong if it fails to maximize utility. Uh, utility, so let's look at these important points. So utility is a word that you're probably not familiar with or you're unsure what it means. Uh, and that's fine because even utilitarians disagree about the correct interpretation for utility. What is it that we're supposed to be maximizing? Some have said that utility just means pleasure, happiness, desire satisfaction, or some other thing, right? But however you end up defining utility, what we're supposed to be doing is producing as much of that thing as possible. Uh, the second important point about utilitarianism is that the theory is outcome oriented, right? So it's not really worried about your intentions for performing some action. Instead, regardless of your intentions, we just look at the outcome of each possible action, right? So you have a set of actions in front of you that you could perform, and you look at the outcome from each action. And then you say, okay, which one of these three outcomes produces the most utility? And then you're morally required to perform that action, right? So it's focused on our outcomes not really on our intentions per for performing actions. Uh, the third important point is that we're measuring net utility. Right? So we look at the utility we produce, and it's okay if we're producing some pain as well, um, as long as on the whole we're producing the most utility. Right? So if utility were defined as pleasure, then we can perform the action which produces the highest net pleasure. Uh, so to think about this in terms of a bioethical problem, right? So somebody needs a shot, but the shot is going to cause them a little bit of pain when you prick them with the needle, right? But that's justified uh, because even though there's a little bit of pain, it's going to produce a lot of pleasure for them in the long term when they don't die from whatever illness the shot prevented. Uh, whereas your other option is to not give them the shot and have them die from their illness, right? So the one in which you give them the shot does cause them a little bit of pain, but on the whole, it maximizes their pleasure. Another sort of more commonplace example is whether or not you should uh, study or hang out with your friends the night before a test, right? So if you think about it in the short term, you go hang out with your friends, that's going to produce a lot of pleasure for you. If you stay home and study, well, that's going to be pretty painful. Studying is not a fun thing to do. But if you look in the long term, right, studying might cause you more pain now 
but over the long haul, it's going to produce you more pleasure because you'll succeed on your test and be able to graduate and go on to the career that you want to have. Whereas if you hang out with your friends, it could produce long-term uh, pain, right? If you end up failing the test and not getting the right GPA and have a hard time getting into college, so on and so forth, right? So you need to look at the long-term outcomes and you need to be worried about what is going to produce the most utility overall. And then the final important point is that we need to calculate utility from an impartial perspective. And so you don't count more in the calculations. Your friends don't count more in the calculations. Uh, people across the globe count just as much as you do. And so this is just ca capturing um, that characteristic of impartiality we talked at the talked about at the beginning of this week. And so when you're calculating utility, you take the pleasure it would produce for you, the pleasure it would produce for the strangers, so on and so forth, and then you see whether or not that action produces the most utility. So you could end up in a really unfortunate situation, right, where something causes you a lot of pain, but it causes pleasure for everybody else. And so you're morally obligated to perform that action because it maximizes utility over um, another option in which you produce pleasure for yourself but end up hurting everybody else, right? So utilitarianism is supposed to um, really capture this notion of impartiality by making sure everybody counts the same in utility calculations. Okay, so what are some examples of utilitarian reasoning in bioethics? Well, a lot of it comes when we're trying to determine how to allocate a budget. Right, so with the limited amount of money we have, we could either provide life-saving care for one or quality of life improvements for 10,000. Uh, if you're a utilitarian, you lean toward the 10,000 quality of life improvements, right? Because producing quality of life improvements for 10,000 is going to come with pleasure for each of those 10,000 people. Uh, so just in terms of a numbers game, we're going to probably be producing far more pleasure if we help the 10,000 than if we just help the one who needs really expensive care. Another example would be um, regarding euthanasia, right? So does euthanasia maximize utility? Is euthanasia morally permissible? Well, it depends. Does it produce maximal utility? Some uh, considerations in favor of euthanasia or that the person can end their life on their own terms, right? That will produce them pleasure. It will bring an end to their suffering. Uh, the family, although it will make them sad, they're going to end up having that same sadness whenever the person dies, but now they're suffering at seeing uh, their family member in this terminal position fades away. Uh, and finally, they're no longer using resources that the hospital could be using on other people. Right. So there could be uh, a number of other considerations we need to bring in here, right, if we're going to truly maximize utility or calculate utility. Uh, but just on its face, it seems like euthanasia is morally permissible for a utilitarian. It has a lot of pleasure producing or at least uh, pain eliminating consequences. Okay. Enough with utilitarianism, let's move on to look at Kantian deontology. So the general principle here is that we should always act in accordance with the universal moral law, what Kant calls the categorical imperative, and we're only praiseworthy if we perform an action out of a sense of duty. So the important points here are that, first of all, this theory is not outcome-based, right? So it's... Um, doing the opposite thing that utilitarianism does here. Our actions are not about producing the best outcome. Instead, our actions are in accordance with rules that should never be violated. Right? So if we could um, lie to our friend and that would they would never know and we would get a lot of happiness out of that, we still shouldn't do it. Right? It's if it's always morally wrong to lie, then we shouldn't lie in those in any case. Right? So moral rules are not to be violated for the sake of producing better outcomes. Uh, second important point is that the theory claims that our intentions matter to moral evaluation. Right? So remember I said when we're talking about utilitarianism, our intentions aren't really that important to the theory. Right? We can have bad intentions 
We don't want to help other people, uh, but our actions still produce uh, the best utility overall, the maximal utility overall, so it's morally right. So even though we could have some evil intentions, our actions could still be good. That's not true for deontology, right? You are not praiseworthy if you have bad intentions. The only time you are morally praiseworthy is if you do the right thing and have the correct intentions. Uh, and then finally, you might be wondering, where does this universal moral law come from? Uh, Kant thinks it's a result of our reason. Just by thinking about human nature and human value, uh, the categorical imperative is revealed to us. So let's look at what the categorical imperative is. And so there are two formulations we're going to look at for the categorical imperative. Formulation one says that we should act only on that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. Now that's a mouthful, but roughly what he's saying here is that we should only act in ways that uh, we would be okay if we were put in that same situation. Right? Uh, so think about this example of the lying promise. So imagine you're broke and you need money uh, in order to survive. Uh, but you know no one's going to give you any money unless you promise to pay them back. So you make a lying promise to pay them back. You promise to pay them back, but it's a lie. Now, in order to know whether or not that's morally permissible, all you have to do is ask yourself, could you will that your action becomes a universal moral law? And here the answer would clearly be no. You couldn't will that your action uh, become a universal law because then any time somebody needed money, they could just simply lie about paying it back. Uh, and then the whole entire system of promising would fall apart, right? And so not only would humanity suffer, but you would suffer as well. Everything uh, falls apart because of it, right? So you could never will that a lying promise becomes a universal law. And so you know that it's morally wrong to perform that action. Formulation two of the imperative says we should act in such a way that we always treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never simply as a means, but always at the same time as an end. Once again, another mouthful. Uh, but roughly what he's saying here is that we have this thing called humanity, and by humanity he means we have this capacity for um, high-level rationality and reasoning, and he thinks that's extremely valuable. And so we should always treat that capability that we have never as something that we can just use for our own ends, right? We have to treat that ability in others as also an end in itself. Uh, and so an example here is that this rules out suicide, right? Because when you commit the act of suicide, you are treating your own humanity as a means to... Uh, the, well, in your case, the pleasure of ending your life, right? To end your suffering, right? So you're saying the value of my rationality, I can get rid of that as a means to eliminating my pain. But that's to use your humanity simply as a means, not also as an end. So suicide would be ruled out according to this formulation of the categorical imperative. Uh, because when you eliminate your rationality, you're eliminating that thing which is of fundamental value. Okay, and so then finally, let's look at some examples of this in uh, this type of reasoning in bioethics. Right. So what happens when we're conduct conducting an experiment which will knowingly result in the death of 10 patients in order to find a cure to a disease? Well, this would violate formulation two of the categorical imperative, right? Because we would be uh, treating those 10 people as a means to an end, right? Uh, now, some might say, look, aren't we also treating them as an end if we get their consent first? But even that would be ruled out because that would be a form of suicide on the patient's uh, end, right? If they knew the experiment would result in their death, they're essentially committing suicide. They're not properly respecting their humanity. And then I'll leave these other two questions for you to think about since we've already gone through a few examples here. Um, and so that's the end of utilitarianism and deontology. And the next one, we'll look at two more moral theories uh, virtue ethics, and Rawlsian contractualism. Thank you.